All right, guys, so we're going to do some tonal painting of a firearm in this one. And so we're going to do this in Creative using the digital brushes, all right? So these are all the uh, default brushes, nothing special here. And so we can start a tonal painting using something like a blocking brush or a fat marker will work fine. Uh, the main thing here, though, is if we're doing a firearm, in this case, we'll do another pistol, but we're just going to start with the template of sorts like i showed in the previous video the sketching video and we'll work from this okay the only difference with tonal value painting is that you're going to be using the grays so near the mid gray higher and lower but don't get too carried away with gray areas we're going to just start coloring in to get started so a lot of people call this a blocking brush, although it's really just a marker, but go ahead and start doing this, right? So there's some benefit to this. It's going to give you a lot more depth information as it relates to the forms, but it is going to be a little bit slower, I think, than doing a line art. One of the main benefits it has, though, is that when, every time you do a stroke, you see we get these little edges kind of left over all over the place. So we get two hard edges every stroke and every time you push a little bit harder you get some more as well and so what happens here is that every time you do this you get these little accidental edges that you can use as kind of inspiration so i've talked about this on the channel before but tonal value painting is sometimes one of the best methods of exploration of forms and shapes and you're trying to create something that's sci-fi. Okay, so keep that in mind. Here we're gonna to try to chisel away at the silhouette a bit, clean it up perhaps a bit. And we could do color samples and take a color sample of the next gray or the gray that we laid down. So if we push down really hard, we get 100% opacity. We can just use that to go to town and uh, start working. And so one of the things here to remember is that we're trying to figure out the big form first. We're not, not worrying about details yet. It's really about form overall. In this case, we're just going to a very basic kind of silhouette of something like a Glock basically, but semi-automatic pistol for starters, right? And at any point during this process, we can create a new layer. And so when we create a new layer, we can change the color gray. We can start doing some shape breakup if we wanted to. Laying in some grays in other places if we wanted to. Don't forget to keep using the line tool if needed so you can make sure you're staying straight. But we can now do this, okay, where we do some shape breakups, perhaps. Use larger, use smaller brushes. You can actually go down really small and use it as a sketcher, or you switch to another brush. So if you don't think the uh, square brush is working for you, you know, switch to a, a soft round brush or, or a hard round brush or whatever you find would be useful in your situation. So if you do this for about an hour, you'll start to get some pretty decent results out of this usually, uh, but it's still going to be fairly vague in, in nature. And so you got a kind of a choice you can make at that, at that point in time. And that is that you can either Go ahead and keep rendering it. Keep adding more tones and making it look better and working out the shading and all kinds of other fun stuff. Or you could take it to 3D perhaps and start blocking it out and adding more details there later since you have a good rough start. Some people are comfortable enough they can do that. Uh, however, you may also want to try doing uh, line art and taking it back to lines and sketching over it as well. And then doing an, a, uh, a shading pass at it and then doing, or, you know, doing the line pass and then doing a shading pass, and seeing what you can get going with that. So, all right, we're gonna do another layer because I don't know what I'm doing back here yet, but I think I need to bring it back out. So we're going to just play around with this area. 
start to have a little fun with it. Okay, and so one other thing I want to mention is that when you're using these gray values, let's start with a shape here, some kind of random shape. Do your shape break up with the other values? You try to create complementary shapes usually. That's the main goal or the idea. So create complementary shapes that go along with the primary. It can also be outside of it as well. They don't have to be a part of it necessarily. Uh, but we can do smaller strokes later on, perhaps, that are just a little bit darker. Don't forget you can blend your brush in and out. So if you push hard and light, you do things like that. So brushwork does become pretty important. So do think about looking into some type of brush brush strokes, different types of brush strokes when it comes to doing art. And we can go through this whole process doing this, no problem. All right. Eventually you add highlights back to things when you need highlights. And this is the process that you go through, even on the pistol over there. So I'm not gonna be able to show you doing the whole thing in this video. I don't want to run it on forever. This is the basic idea. And on top of this, you have this little smudger tool down here, right? This one, this blender blur brush. Okay, I'm gonna reset it and just turn the opacity down, use it larger. You'll find that when you start doing this, right? You can use this at different sizes as well, just different strengths. If you leave it up in strength, it'll tend to smudge more. But if you turn it down in the opacity there, it'll tend to blur more. Okay, it doesn't blur perfectly, but it does well enough. And so you can blur things out, create like little drop shadow effects, perhaps. Uh, but more importantly, you can start looking at these tonal values and stop looking at them as so much as a drawing, but as it is just a lump of clay somewhere. Okay, when you lump some more darker clay next to it or something, and you put some other clay next to that. You can start using it with that blur brush or the blender. You can start making forms with it relatively fast, right? Yeah, it's kind of a bad example, maybe, but keep doing this. Eventually, what you'll find happens is you no longer feel like you're just working with um, color or tones anymore. You feel like you're working with clay. And I think that's kind of important to recognize and understand is that you're able to start working with it super fast. You can do organic stuff with it. You can do hard surface mechanical stuff with it. But it's just little setups of clay, more or less. And we can have fun with it, create shapes and forms with it. OK, so just think about that. Now, there's a ton of rendering techniques out there. So I'm not going to be able to cover all of the different types of rendering techniques either, but you can certainly do this to come up with some really interesting stuff, right? You can add some hard edges back if you needed to. You can do some more kind of like line art type drawings if needed. But I think you get where this is going now. We're able to change things up quite dramatically very fast, right? And that blend tool or that blur tool, you don't always want to go super heavy with it. There's another technique where you drop in, like you see, I'm using pure white. I drop it in a little bit. This is pressure sensitive opacity, so I know it's not pure white, it's gray, right? Uh, I could color sample that, and I can go back in and deliberately work this shape now and tighten it up if needed, right? And start creating whatever it is I want to create, more or less. You don't always go back and blur things necessarily, super heavy at least because you'll have to eventually start detailing them. Of course, detailing is where most of your time should be spent anyways when it comes to doing uh, an image anyways. So you should be worried about adding things like textures and whatnot. So if we switch to a different brush, you'll see here, you can do more of like a short stroke line art type deal through here maybe. And if I blend that real quick, just knock it back a bit. All right. You see, we didn't get rid of the lines entirely. Sometimes you want to leave them a little bit so you can get some more texture going. But 
you I'm gonna mix it with a little color. Color is not gonna be a tone, obviously. Like colors have tones, but it's not necessarily the same as tonal value painting. But I can do this and then start knocking things back just a tiny little bit. This is how you do photorealistic rendering, by the way. Okay, I'll just keep working things in this manner without using photo bash anyways or textures from an image. You'd have to come up with all your textures by hand otherwise. So this is less efficient. There's no reason to do this in digital necessarily, but it's good practice anyways. It's something you think about. So it would be much better to create like a noisy brush or some kind of texture brush that'll help you along the process. But uh, whatever the case, you can do layers and overlays and all that other fun stuff. But so just keep in mind, that's that's what this is about. And so as we're working here, we're not stuck with what we see is what we get. Um, we're able to just keep working. At any point, we can drop the size of the brush or switch to another one. We don't have to use... Um, we, we don't have to use black and white to do lines. We can use grays. We can do lighter grays. So if we want to start creating the idea of, oh, that wasn't light enough. We want to start doing little edges or little shading effects here or there. Let me reset that brush real quick. It's got too large there. We can do this number all day long, right? So don't forget to use the line tool to keep things straight though. Hold shift while using it and it will straighten out. And the reason I want to point this out is because a lot of firearms, it's more about the edges reflecting the light than it is about the midsections reflecting light. Okay. So you're going to see a lot of stuff like that going on. Matter of fact, bring in an image of a firearm and turn it black and white and then look at it. And tell me how the lighting looks on it. You'll see that happens quite a bit. Not always, but a lot of times it does. There's little subtle nuances as well. It's like you see we're doing this even like even though it's tonal value painting. Um, I'm gonna collapse all these real quick. So you select your layers, you can select them, hold control, select multiple, or hold shift and select through. Like so. I'm gonna press E, use the eraser. So even though it's tonal value painting, it's really like an extension of drawing, in my opinion, to some extent. Because we have a lot of room to experiment here uh, with what we're doing. It's really nice to go subtle with the grays and creep up on your, your dark and light tones. Sometimes you can't get away with that. So let's say like in this area here, um, if we use a square brush, it could work possibly, a rectangle, but there's this other brush here, which is like a hard uh, pressure sensitive, so the hard round brush basically. Um, but this one here is going to be like a soft round one version of that. These work good for more organic stuff. So. Uh, when it comes to form on a pistol grip, obviously, you have a thumb rest area, right? So you might just do color samples after you lay down some lines. Start working things in this manner, right? Start t start changing the tones of things a little bit in different key areas. You can go around and change the tones elsewhere as well as needed. But you're trying to get those big ideas started first. You're not worried about like the pattern of a grip or whether where it's broken up or whatever. You're just worried about getting the big ideas going first. You see, in this area it's getting a little. It'll start to look a little cloudy because of that pattern I just did. But you can try to fix that later if you need. And so we could go back. We can color sample things. And use them at full strength potentially. I try and work those things out as needed. But just as doing that little example over there, you know, if we want some lighter stuff in here, we could do that. So it starts to feel like clay, and you would do that inside of the silhouette more or less. Is what you're looking to looking to do ultimately. Some other times you might have little elements you got to keep working. All right. 
in a case of a pistol anyways a lot of times the lighting when you look at photographs of it it's side lit it's not top down lit it's side lit and so you'll actually get still dark edges a lot of times in these areas okay so that's something you might see but it's not to say it will always be the case right and we could use that blender the size of the blender matters as well like if you are trying to do a big gradient across a big area you need to use a bigger brush but if you're doing more detailed stuff you want to take that a little bit smaller perhaps and use it lighter see what i'm saying and so trying to get this to do just right can be real problematic it can it can be pretty frustrating sometimes because uh, it doesn't blend 100 percent perfect every time and so if you go to your brush settings, you can always modify brushes, but precision turning it up helps. And also sometimes changing the density and turning it down also helps. Uh, but the thing with the density is it introduces noise. Okay. So, uh, which isn't a bad thing if you're going for photorealistic results, uh, but sometimes it's really not um, helpful, I'd say, at the beginning of projects. So you, you might not always want to have that extra noise, but it does actually make it blend a little bit slower too. So it's pretty nice overall once you get used to using it. And so we'll go through this process here for a little bit and then we'll end this video, but you know, use it larger if you want bigger gradients, right? Sometimes you're still gonna have to go back to the marker and readjust things. Realize that the lighting on a real farm anyways may have any number of things happening in this area when it comes to shading. And so you're going to have to play around with it for a little bit, get the hang of it. But it's definitely one of the more powerful techniques out there. It's definitely something you want to learn. Maybe you won't use it all the time. Eventually you'll find yourself just going straight to 3D anyways, but it's definitely something you want to think about. Doing things like this. You want to be very deliberate with it too. Thin lines go a long way. Uh, over bright areas sometimes can go a long way. So like using pure white, pure black is not uncommon. As long as you're keeping them thin. So when you do that blur again next time, can work that area very deliberately. Don't do it very heavy. All right, you see what's going on there now? Starting to make a little bit more sense in this area. You can do little light circles sometimes. It helps go back and forth as needed. Okay, so it starts to work out. That's, that's the main idea. We'll get it going. So if you get the hang of this well enough, what you do is you um, you don't worry about blending it until like the very end. So like you'll know, like we go up to that edge and we go through this area. We leave that edge there maybe. We can bring all this down in tone. And so this is going to be a little bit harder to do than if you were to just... Um, do a sketch, right? Takes practice with this one. It's just a tiny bit harder. It doesn't really, it's not really too crazy, but it's just a, definitely something you want to think about. And you can bring things forward and backwards by changing the tone, tonal value there. But also you can change the material. So if you bring something down in tone, the materials might look like it changes as well. So let's say this is all a um like aluminum up here or steel or something. Yeah. Maybe we don't have that bottom edge there. Let's get rid of that. Okay. And so uh, this is going to be polymer down here, plastic basically. So can we go darker with it? Yeah. And we should. We should go to about the same dark level there as the grip 
basically. We can leave some light lightning, I guess, over there. For now, maybe get rid of a little here. Bring it all the way forward. And go right over that one in the middle there, I think. Okay. We can change our tones a little bit darker, perhaps. And go through and mark that again. And so you see where this is going now, or where it can possibly go? Is it, this process will take place and it's not going to be a real big deal after a while. Make little adjustments. I'm going to knock something back a little. Can. It's all on one layer right now, but your layers, you can collapse them, right? So do, do use new layers when you want to, but uh, collapse them at some point too. Because like, I'm not sure what I want to do here with the slide. Maybe I want to run this back. So I do a new layer. I start running it back, just see what happens here. Like, can we make this look better if it was a solid piece all the way through? Possibly. I mean, that's that's a real thing that could happen, right? Or if we ran that all the way through. Let's have this weird feature here at the top. But, you know, if I don't like this setup, I can just knock it back, right? That's the, that's the good thing about the layers. So until you find what you like, uh, you can do this. Now, here's, where get, here's the real kicker anyways. Uh, we could go through this whole process doing this, uh, but we can break the firearm down into sections with layers and do clipping groups, which I'm not going to get into in this video, but basically you could do like the trigger at one time, you could do the uh, the top of the frame, then you could do the grip, then you can swap and mix different pieces and do different iterations uh, if you really wanted to explore a lot of different designs, perhaps. It's something you could possibly do. So. A little bit more on the uh, professional side when it comes to doing a bunch of variations and stuff, right? But um, it's possible. So, and of course, if you have uh, Photoshop or other programs that you use, there's nothing wrong with that uh, to use other programs. So, if you feel more comfortable in those programs, use those. Don't, you don't necessarily have to use Krita. Uh, Krita by itself is um, is decent, but it's not real good at photo bashing per se, I would say. And so you want to think about, you know, maybe getting Photoshop if you want to do some heavy photo bashing, especially. You know, just because a tool is open source and free doesn't mean it's always going to keep you from having to use professional tools still. Although Krita is really powerful for creating artwork in general, doing brushwork anyways. And so, but it has some drawbacks to it, like a lot of software out there. I'm gonna pull this one back through here. Try to keep it straight. I could use a line tool and just continue it real quick and that'd be the easiest way. Um, I don't want this little highlight here. Okay, I don't want that little grungy effect all the way through either. So yeah, you still have to take your time at a certain point and go through and make sure you're just getting the changes done that you need done. There's no way around that, unfortunately. Uh, you'll still do line work, very light lines. So like I'm using pure black, but I'm using it very lightly. So it's coming in as a dark gray. Not a big deal there. So you can add shadow to areas. Remember, if it's a painting, you don't do dark outlines on uh, possibly like the uh, the lighter side of the, the object when you're shading, right? Instead, you would probably want to use your light grays instead, right? So let's just try to finish going through this real quick. I think we can already see we got some kind of interest going on at least. We could probably do a lot more, but um, for now, I think it's, it's at least interesting looking and we can um, maybe do a color sample here. And I just wanna lay out the idea of a rectangle in this area, or excuse me, rectangle, a triangle. Uh, so I can grab this other brush again. You can see this one has a hard time getting in corners sometimes. Uh, so if you have a tablet that can change the angle based on drawing, 
angle of the or the tilt of the pin. Uh, sometimes that can be useful. Sometimes it's a little awkward, but you can see I almost can get all that without messing up the silhouette there, which could be useful, right? Make it a little bit smaller. I probably wouldn't have any problem with that. But color sample here. I'm just trying to figure out if I should do a taper inwards or not. Probably can on the other two edges, but not the top one. You see. And that's sideways again. Okay. A little darker. So you're going to do manual shading at some point or another, no doubt. All right. So all in all, in about 30 minutes, we've got okay results. Not perfect, but okay results. And then so later on, what's going to happen is you go back through and you start adding all your extra details. In the case of a pistol, you know, you're going to need, uh, well, probably should have done these earlier, but you're going to need your weapon sights. You're going to need your safety, your slide release, all the other fun stuff too. And so you can fill those in when you deem appropriate. I'm going to keep that one real simple for now. But you can you could definitely render those more if you wanted to. Those are usually easier to do in 3D, in my opinion, because it's not much to look at from the side. But um, then you'll go back and add your uh, grip as well, grip layout. There are additional lining elements that we didn't really get to look at. It's a lot of times, like. These come through here like that. This even will oftentimes drop from way up here, come down over here. So just keep that in mind. I might have missed that one a little bit. But you do want to look at photo references as you're working that way in case uh, you're not sure where something is usually placed on a firearm. You know, look at multiple firearms and you'll see kind of the common layouts of them anyways. And, It'll help you out a little bit at least. See, this was still on that new layer, so if I wanted to erase this even, you can use a smudger to erase as well. Yes, I think you can. Pretty sure I've done it before. Oh, maybe you can't. Which one does that? I don't know. All right, so we'll use this one real quick. There's a there's a brush that doesn't you wouldn't think normally could be used as an eraser, but then you can't use it as an eraser. It's not this one. It's something I'm thinking of. I also have an airbrush. And the airbrush, you know, I turn the size lower. If you go into the uh, settings for it, turn down the density quite quite heavily. It's going to get pretty noisy, but it, it's also a great way of going through here and just adding some shading. Okay, so if you ever really want to key in on your shading, this is a really good one to use for that. Use it very lightly. Use the grays too. You can see we can just work that out quite nicely. So any other brushes you want to use, you can use of course as well. You see that noisy airbrush is quite interesting though. And you can, of course, uh, go back and blur this as well. Nothing says you can't blur this, all right? But I'll get rid of the noise as well. Let's see. But when you need it back, there you go. If you want to overwrite the airbrush, or, or excuse me, you could overwrite it if you wanted, but uh, it's better to save a new brush. So anytime you make a modification to a brush you like, just go ahead and save out a new one. And uh, give it a nice name that you can remember and you can easily find it. And there'll be no problems. So if you're wondering how to do that, just save new brush. And there you go, give it a name. And it'll show up under all, but it'll be kind of a, under all until you assign it to a quick favorite or my favorites or somewhere else as well. Whatever. 
wherever you want to put it, I guess. So when it comes down to rendering, okay, since we only got so far on this, eventually you'll find yourself rendering everything, like super fine detail everywhere. Uh, it's kind of the same process, but on just a smaller level, okay? So you might still do some line work, but you take that blender, you might go through and just kind of smudge them a bit, perhaps, or um, very carefully shade everything. So you might just take the brushes a lot smaller. And that's how that's how you're going to get into photorealistic rendering right there, basically. It takes a little, it takes a little bit of time to get into this, but you got to clean it up. You got to clean it up. You have to do all the lighting on everything, the texture work, etc. You might take that blender, and you might only blend one side of an edge. Or like a stroke, it's just got two edges, right? Every stroke. And there you go. So you can see, we start to hold some really neat, clean lines there at some point. Uh, and make a farm. So let me go ahead and add a trigger for the thumbnail of the video, I guess. Uh, that'll be it for this for the most part. So using that marker again. All right, so we can spend some time on that one to make it look right, but and it needs a magazine. Don't worry about the other details, but for now, you can see where this goes, which is great. You see how that all kind of works together now. Do something like that. Okay, it's colored in too. Why not? We'll give it a darker. Tone here. So traditional painting, you would probably sketch with a pencil first. And you would probably paint over it doing an underpainting, but a lot of times your paint would be semi-transparent. And so it's virtually what we're doing here. If we were to start with lines and then go over it with tones, start shading it. It's basically the same idea. So and because uh, when you start an acrylic painting, usually you work uh, background to foreground. So you do your lighter lighter stuff first, and then you get into the darker, um, darker parts. But sometimes you need to add a subject on top of a background. You would use something like chalk potentially, right? To do a little another sketch on top of the, the painting you already done once it's dried. So you can add stuff to it without messing it up. Because if you mess up on the chalk drawing, then of course you can uh, just wipe it off with a white cloth or whatever. That looks pretty messed up there, actually. Let's try and change that. And so um, that's your layers here in Krita, basically. So add layers as needed, make changes, and then... work on them but if you mess up just take it away but if you like what you did you know just keep it i think that's too dark i wonder if i could just take that and oh no that's all of that huh? okay so here's what i'm gonna do i take this gray and just go over it all lightly in this area we'll call it here all right, so that's going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. Try it out. You know, you can spend a whole hour on this, no problem, and work it out to um, pretty close to completion, I'd say, in an hour. The grip itself, you would want to maybe use a new layer to do that, and then uh, also try doing things like layer styles or whatever else, um, other type of art techniques you can use here in, in doing digital art. You know, you're not doing traditional art. You don't have to keep it all in one layer. And just uh, explore all the tools available to you, right? So anyways, that's it for the video. Hope you enjoy and check you out in the next one.